All right, we're on. Good evening to everybody. Good to see you. Um, let me make a couple of mentions uh, real quick. Um, first of all, next Wednesday evening, we will not meet in here. Next Wednesday evening will be our uh, Vacation Bible School family night. So um, all the staff will be tied up with that and so forth. We invite you to come. You're welcome to come be a part of it. And, you know, we're hoping to have... Um, obviously a number of guests and so forth and uh, would encourage you to come hang out with them and talk to guests and all that sort of stuff so you're welcome to come and be a part of that uh, I think we're going to meet in the sanctuary but then there's going to be stuff going on all around um, so indoors and outdoors alike so keep that in mind then we will resume on the 21st back in here the week after that and on that night we're going to be going back to uh, live with our Facebook. Um, so for those that are going to be seeing this video tonight, you'll actually uh, see this video next Wednesday. Uh, this will be played next Wednesday the 14th, and then on the 21st everything will be live and everybody will be caught up and on the same page. So just keep that in mind if you would. main thing is just keep in mind we won't meet in here next Wednesday, um, but we do encourage you to be uh, a part of... Um, Vacation Bible School Family Night, if you would, okay? All right, I think that's all the announcements. Uh, just as another reminder, I'm going to mention this Sunday. I shared it with you last week. Um, they're talking about end of July before our sign goes in, um, delays on shipping and that sort of stuff. Um, so that's where we are on that, okay? All right, so if you take your Bibles and open them to Psalm 16, Psalm number 16, um, as you uh, open your Bibles, let me just uh, pause for a moment. Let's uh, have a word of prayer, and we'll get started. Lord, we come before you this evening uh, thanking you again for, Lord, your grace and your mercy, your loving kindness and tender mercies, the God that have been uh, upon us today. Father, we, uh, we love you. We praise you. We thank you. Father, we recognize that uh, we are fully and completely dependent upon you. Uh, Father, we know that the greatest privilege that we have is to be able to walk with you and fellowship with you each and every day. And um, Lord, to be a faithful witness for Jesus through both what we do and, and what we say. And Father, we uh, thank you again for the privilege tonight of gathering together. We ask your blessing on our time together. We also, Lord, look forward to, if you tear your coming and you allow us to see um, next Sunday, the Lord's Day, we ask your blessing, God, upon that and continue to help our church as we worship you and serve you, as we reach out, as we grow and see, um, Lord, new folks coming and worshiping with us and becoming a part of our church family. And we pray your blessings on Vacation Bible School. And just pray, Father, especially that you'd bless uh, Angela Tyler as they work on planning all that but also the other volunteers and most importantly Lord for the children and then for their families that'll be with us next Wednesday evening pray God you would use this as an opportunity to plant the seed of the gospel and Lord to uh, not just Lord reach and minister to children but to their families as well so bless our time together now we pray in Jesus name amen all right, Psalm number 16. So as you open up your Bible and you look at Psalm 16, one of the things you're going to notice there in the heading is a term that you're probably not familiar with, and it's the term mictum. You see that? And uh, you say, well, what in the world is a mictum? Well, there's some varying opinions and so forth, but basically it's believed that uh, a mictum, and by the way, Psalm 16 and then Psalms 56 through 60 have the same heading. But it's believed that the term mictum um, can be interpreted in this way, a golden jewel, all right? So in other words, um, something really special that stands out. You know, you have, you know, you talk about a person, you know, somebody that you really admire. Uh, maybe it's somebody who's already passed. You say, boy, you know, he or she, they were a jewel. You know what that means. You get that idea. Um, it also can mean this, and, and this goes along with that idea of a golden jewel. Um, it also refers to a, a psalm to be 
hung up and displayed or maybe inscribed on a pillar that commemorates a victory. So in other words, it's, it's something that would be um, placed either on the wall or, or carved in stone or whatever because it says something and it reminds you of something. It's kind of like, I guarantee you, every one of us in our homes, uh, you either have prints or you've got those little plaques that hang on the wall or those little things that sit on the shelf that have these sayings and statements that just speak to you. Um, and you have them displayed there because you want them there. They speak to you. They remind you. They encourage you. They remind and encourage others that come to your home. It may even be something that's used as a, a witness, you know, to others and so forth. So that kind of gives you an idea uh, uh, of what we're talking about. And uh, so all of these psalms are called mictums because the one thing that they all have in common is, is that they all end on a note of victory. Uh, every one of them. And um, so Psalm 16 and Psalms 56 through 60. Here's another thing about Psalm 16 that you need to be aware of, and we'll see this as we move along. It's also a messianic psalm. It is a prophetic psalm in the sense, in fact, you, you find this in uh, Acts chapter 2 and 13 where um, uh, the apostles make reference to Psalm number 16 referring to Jesus and to his resurrection and talking about how David as a prophet spoke of something that was beyond him. And as we, we've talked about Messianic Psalms in the past, and especially that was Psalm 2, the psalm always speaks to the original writer, author, and audience, but there are always pieces in these Messianic Psalms that speak of something that is beyond anything that the writer ever experienced or could experience. And that could only be fulfilled by Messiah, uh, who obviously is the Lord Jesus. So we're talking about uh, the title we have for tonight is The Victory of Faith. And as with it being a mictum, a, a psalm that ends on a note of victory, that's just fitting for it. Uh, but as I think about that term, I think about a verse of Scripture, 1 John chapter 5, verse 4, that says this, For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. Now, y'all can help me finish this. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our, what? Faith. Now, so maybe you're not quite familiar with that particular text. I'll guarantee you all of you will remember the old hymn, Faith is the Victory. Remember the old hymn? Um, that we used to sing. <laughs> um, goes like this, encamped, the first verse, encamped along the hills of light, ye Christian soldiers rise and press the battle ere the night shall veil the glowing skies. Against the foe and veils below, let all our strength be hurled. Faith is the victory we know that overcomes the world. And then the chorus, faith is the victory, O glorious victory that overcomes the world. So that's what we're, we're talking about, the victory of faith. Um, the faith that enables us to overcome, to attain victory through the Lord, and so forth and so on. So in the psalm, we're going to talk about three main thoughts that David shares in Psalm 16 concerning the victory of faith. Um, faith brings us into relationship with God, but it is through faith that God leads us on to victory. Victory over sin, victory over death, victory over the grave, victory over hell, victory over the world, so forth and so on. Okay? So, three, three main thoughts. Here's the first one. All right? The first thing that we, we find David talking about in this verse is the life of faith. All right? In verses 1 through 4, the life of faith. Now, look at verse number 1. He says... Preserve me, O God. And then the last part of that verse says, For in you I put my, what? Trust. And, and, and so, what is faith? Faith is trusting God, right? So, so David begins out talking about the life of faith. Preserve me, O God, for in you I put my trust. And, and so, and that's, that's very fitting. David's walk, David's experience, and so forth, um, consistent with what the Scriptures teach. Did you know that throughout the Bible, um, 
the scriptures teach us that faith is the way in which we are made right with God. In fact, the term, the just shall live by faith, is really one of the key themes of the Bible. You find it all the way back in the book of Genesis. All right? Can you think of a character in the book of Genesis where that really becomes obvious? Okay? Um, father, of, father of faith. Okay? Father of the household of faith. You know what, what, what was his name? Abraham. Okay? Remember in Genesis chapter 15, verse 6, there's this statement that says, and, and God accounted it to him for righteousness. He believed God, and God accounted it to him for righteousness. So, so in other words, right there at the very beginning, and we find it even before that because we've been talking about grace all the way through the book of Genesis on Sunday mornings. But there you really begin to see it being encapsulated. It's really taken very clear shape. So how was it that Abraham was made right with God? Through faith. He believed God. Well, why, what did he believe from God? Think about God's relationship. How had God been dealing with Abraham? What has God been making to Abraham all along since Genesis chapter 12? Covenant promises. God's been making covenant promises to Abraham. And what was Abraham's responsibility? What was his responsibility? How was he to respond to those promises? To believe. Faith, to trust God. And so you come down to Genesis 15, verse number 6, and there you begin seeing it pulled together. And he believed God, and God accounted it to him for righteousness. doesn't say he, got, he gave God money, or he made X number of sacrifices, or he did this right or that. Because we know Abraham had his own flaws. He had a really bad tendency of lying about his wife to, to save his own skin. So it wasn't because he was perfect. He believed God and God accounted it to him for righteousness. And so you find that, and that, that's kind of the basis. You move on through the Old Testament and so forth. And, and then you come down to Habakkuk, and Habakkuk is the one who coined the phrase, the just shall live by faith. You know what? You get to the New Testament, and you find out that the New Testament writers pick up on that. Paul in the book of Romans, in the book of Galatians, the writer of Hebrews, they use that term, the just shall live by faith. Those that are considered just and right before God are considered so because of their faith, their trust in God. Okay? So, so what David's talking about right here, that, that the, the essence, the foundation of a life of faith is about trusting in God. Now, so there are two things that David shares with two truths in light of that that David shares. Okay, two truths that, that when we come into a life of faith and we're trusting God, there are two truths that are, that are certain that you can count on. Here's the first one. First of all, so a life of faith is a life preserved by God. All right, go back to verse number one, okay? Notice where he says, Preserve me, O God, for in you I put my trust, all right? He's trusting God, and so he's, he's asking God, trusting God to preserve him. Now, let me ask you a question. What does the word preserve mean? What does it mean? In this context right here, what does it mean? Let me tell you what it doesn't mean in this context. It's not about uh, making preserves and pickling things, all right, and putting them in the pressure cooker, <laughs> It's not that. So what's he, what's he asking? Preserve me, O God, for in you I put my trust. Yeah, keep me. In fact, the word in this verse right here, preserve, means to guard, to protect, to keep safe and secure. And, and so David's saying, God, preserve me, uh, because in you, I'm, put, I'm counting on you, God. I'm trusting you, and I'm asking. So, listen, there's not anything here in this psalm that indicates that David's talking about God preserving him from some physical threat. Now, you know we've already been through the psalms. You've read the, He's always got enemies after him and so forth and so on. In this particular text, there's not anything that implies there's some kind of an imminent physical danger against David. So he's thinking on different terms right now. Now, w would that include... God protecting him physically? Yes. But primarily what he's talking about 
is God protecting him, preserving him, securing him spiritually. That's what he's talking about, okay? It reminds me of what Peter said. I don't know if you remember 1 Peter 1, 5. But, you know, in, in 1 Peter chapter 1, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus, who's uh, blessed us so that we've been born again through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, so forth and so on. Born again to a living hope. But then he goes on, Peter says in verse number 5, and he says, And that we are, listen to this, kept by the power of God. Okay? Now think about that. First Peter 1 5. We are kept by the power of God. Through faith is what Peter says. So what does the keeping? What did Peter say? We are kept by the what? Power of God. So who does the keeping? God. Through what? Faith. That's our part. So, so to me, you know, tremendous, tremendous example there, again, reminder of the security of the believer. We'll talk more about that in just a few minutes. So bottom line, here's what we come with. Listen, we can't, we, you know, the Bible teaches that we are depraved. Basically, you know what that means? It means that we are totally and completely incapable of saving ourselves. We are incapable on our own of living for God. We are incapable of keeping ourselves saved. Who does the keeping? Who does the preserving? God. What is our part? Faith. So the first thing we find in this life of faith is, is that the first truth is, is, is that our life is preserved by God, our spiritual life, eternal life, all right? Second thing we find is this that a life of faith is also a life devoted to God. So it's interesting. We're, what we're talking about here is this. We're talking about as it pertains to life, spiritual life. So now we're, we've, we've seen God's part. Here's our part, our response. So, so what is it that God wants out of us through this relationship? He just wants us to take this life that he's given us, the physical life, all the trappings of life, and most importantly, spiritual life, and God just wants us to live a life of devotion to him out of love and gratitude. Is that too much to ask? You know, you'd think, boy, that's, some people just don't seem to get that. That's, that's, a, that's an easy piece to figure out, isn't it? All right, so go back and uh, he says, uh, verse 2, Oh, my soul, you have said to the Lord. So he's having kind of this conversation with himself about all of this. Oh, my soul... You have said to the Lord, you are my Lord. You see that right there? That's a pretty definitive thing, isn't it? What's he declaring in that? Yeah, and that he, he's devoted to God. He said, you are my Lord. That's a very personal statement. Uh, my goodness is nothing apart from you. Another way of saying that, another way of saying that is, is apart from you, God, I have nothing to offer. I have no goodness. Verse 3, as for the saints on the earth, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. Who's he talking about when he says the saints who are on the earth? Who's he talking about? Who's he referring to? Other believers. Yeah, other believers, other people that trust and worship God, other people who've devoted their life to the Lord, okay? As for the saints on the earth, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. So in other words, it's like this. And I've said this before. Here's, here's a, I believe, a true genuine mark of a, of a genuine believer and certainly a, a spirit-filled, spiritually mature believer, and that is this. If you love God, you're going to love the ones he loves. If you love God, you're going to love his people. It's just part and parcel. That's basically what he's saying right there. It reminds me of, I don't know how, how familiar you are with the book of Ruth. Okay, remember Ruth back in the Old Testament? And she comes back with, with her uh, mother-in-law, Naomi, and her uh, sister-in-law, Orpah, I guess is how you pronounce that. Oprah fixed it, made it different. But, um, so anyway, 
So the other sister-in-law decides, well, I'm going back home, all right? And Naomi pleads with Ruth to do the same thing. I have no more sons to offer you. I have nothing. And, and I love what Ruth said right here. She said this, Do not urge me to leave you or return from following you. For where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Now listen to this. Your people shall be my people and your God my God. Well, let me tell you something. When, when you know the Lord and you worship him and you love him, his people are your people. Warts, flaws, and all. Why? Because we're spiritual family. So it's a life that is devoted. Listen, he goes on and says this. Look at verse 4. Their sorrows shall be multiplied who hasten after another god. In other words, people who worship another god, false gods, pagan gods, and so forth, their sorrows are going to be multiplied. But listen to this. Their drink offerings of blood I will not offer, nor take up their name on my lips. In other words, they are, they are foul, they are dead, they are powerless gods. He says, I'm not going to have any part and parcel in that. I'm not even going to mention their names. It, it, that's just a way, another way of him expressing his own devotion to God. I don't want none of that because they're not true gods and they can't give me what my God gives me, what my God does for me. Life, love, every good thing. So basically, there again, David is affirming that the life of faith is a life preserved by God, by his grace, kept by the power of God, and that it is a life of devotion, a true life. Listen, to this, a genuine true life of faith is a life of devotion to the one true God. Now that alone right there is a major a sermon just by itself. And then as you think about when it says about, and I will love your people, what a greater joy and blessing. I just, I, there again, I just, so many professing believers, I just don't get it. What I call Lone, Rain, Lone Ranger Christians, which by the way, that is not scriptural. That is not biblical. You've heard me say that um, before. But, but here's what I don't get. To be able to know God to experience the gift of spiritual life, eternal life, to, to know that that God preserves you, keeps you saved, keeps you safe, close to him, keeps you in relationship with him. You didn't get yourself in it, and you're not going to get yourself out of it or anything else. Um, to love God's people, and then to be able to meet with God's people and to share and to fellowship and to worship, and it blows my mind. So many people who call themselves Christian, they, they don't want any part of that. There again, you got to wonder. You, gotta, you have to wonder. Is that the fruit of a true follower and worshiper of God? What a, what a greater pleasure and privilege is there than to be able to share our faith and our fellowship with each other in the Lord. We need that. Now let me give you another stanza. I've been, uh, I started out, faith is the victory. Let me give you another stanza. Here's stanza number two. His banner over us is love, our sword, the word of God. We tread the road, the saints above, with shouts of triumph. triumph. Now did you hear that? Listen to that. We tread the road, the saints above, with shouts of triumph trod. You know what that means? We're walking the same paths and having the same experiences, life experiences that they had. Where we live in the 21st century, they lived back in the 1st century and even before and so forth. But you want to know something? When you get down to the fundamentals of life and what it is to be a human being... Nothing's changed. It hasn't changed. There's still struggle, pain, heartache, difficulty, all those kinds of things. We tread the road the saints above with shouts of triumph trod. By faith they, like a whirlwind's breath, swept on or every field. The faith by which they conquered death is still our shining shield. And faith is the victory. So, so the first thing we see is this. is We've seen the life of faith, okay? Second thing we see is this, verses 5 through 6, the gift of faith. 
Now, I want you to, know, I want you to look at this really close. The gift of faith. Verses 5 and 6. Here's what he says. O Lord, you are the portion of my inheritance and my cup. You maintain my lot. The lions have fallen to me in pleasant places. Yes, I have a good inheritance. Now, let me read that again because I'm going to ask you a question here in just a moment. Verse 5. O Lord, you are the portion of my inheritance and my cup. You maintain my lot. The lions have fallen to me in pleasant places. Yes, I have a good inheritance. Now, here's the question. Now, because we're talking about the gift of faith, okay? From those verses, what is the gift of faith? And the answer is in those verses right there. In fact, I'll tell you this, it's in the first verse. No, well, yeah, you're on it, but, but listen to it. Read the verse. So if you say, okay, the gift of faith is my inheritance, read the verse. What does he say is our inheritance? The Lord, the gift of faith is the Lord himself. He is our inheritance. I don't know if you remember, uh, back in the Old Testament, in the book of Numbers, when, um, when God's talking about, you know, he's going to allot the tribes, land, and so forth. But remember, he takes Aaron, okay, the Levites, and he sets Aaron aside and he says to Aaron, you're not going to have an allotment in the land. But then he follows it up with this and he says, but I am your portion. In other words, he was saying, God was saying, I'm going to be your allotment, your gift, okay? And, and so what, what David's saying here is that the gift is God himself. And, you know, you think about that. How often do we talk about the blessings that God gives us and the gifts that God gives us and all this sort of stuff? And the reality is this. The greatest gift he gives is himself. You think about this. If, if, if the only thing Jesus, if the only thing God had ever done for us is Jesus dying on the cross, being buried and raised from the dead, and, and, and he saves us and forgives us and gives us eternal life, if that were the only thing he ever did for us, that's enough. Absolutely. In fact, that's very much along the lines of what Paul said in the book of Ephesians chapter 1, that he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavens it reminds me of um, the, the the story the illustration I've used a number of times over the years but and I've, I've shared it here back probably within the last couple of years but it's about this uh, father and son who are very close this goes back into the 1960s true story true story the father was a very wealthy man his son his only son is drafted into the army he goes over, he fights in Vietnam. While he's in Vietnam, he meets a young man who becomes, they become best friends. This new best friend uh, of the son also happened to be a pretty accomplished artist in doing oil, pa oil paintings. So as he gets to know his new friend, he discovers what a close relationship that he and his father have. So this young man, the artist, he decides to do a portrait of that man's son while they're in Vietnam. And so he does this portrait and they manage to ship it back um, to the father back in the States. And, and it also just so happens, another reason why that was a, a motivation, motivating factor in this is that the, the father of this uh, son was also an avid collector of art, had an extensive collection of art. In fact, had a whole wing in his house that was dedicated to where he uh, displayed the art that he had collected over the years. So anyway, he receives this uh, painting of his son. It becomes his prized possession. Well, time passes and it's not, I don't remember how long it was, but eventually he gets word that his son is killed in action in Vietnam. 
And father, obviously the father's just heartbroken and so forth. Um, but already he had put that painting of his son, you know, in center display. Well, the father dies. Word goes out there's going to be an auction of, of, of the art and so forth. And so people come from all over the country and some people from different parts of the world, they come on a certain given day for the auction because they know he has some really, really nice pieces of art. And the auctioneer gets up and says, it's time to begin the auction. And he said, and the first piece uh, of art that's going to be auctioned is this portrait. And it was the portrait of that man's son. And people are like really disappointed, like, you know, nobody wants that thing. So they start bidding and so forth and so on. It's really slow and everything. And eventually the bid goes up and, 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 and finally it stops. And the auctioneer says, you know, once, twice, three times, sold to whoever it was that had made the, the highest bid. But then he said this, and this is what really blew everybody's mind. He said, and that brings to a conclusion today's auction and people were just shocked they were angry about he said, how in the world can you possibly we've traveled to get here and so forth and so on and then he made this announcement and he said it was this gentleman whatever his name was it was his will that whoever purchased the portrait of his son gets everything in the collection It comes back to the principle of Scripture, what we're talking about right here. Jesus said this, if whoever has the Son has life. When you have Him, He is your inheritance, and you have everything. That's the point that David is making. He is the gift. And, and you know, there, there are a couple of things that go along with this. So here's the thing. Here you have in the Old Testament... I believe, a statement that, uh, that underscores the nature of salvation, okay? The nature of salvation. You say, well, what is the nature of salvation? All right, write down this verse, John 17, 1 through 3. Here's the nature, the essence of salvation, okay? It says this. this. Remember, this is Jesus' high priestly prayer just prior to his crucifixion. Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son also may glorify you, as you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And here's the key, verse 3. And this is eternal life. Here's the real nature. Here's the real essence of what salvation is about. And this is eternal life, that they may know you the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you have sent the, the, the nature the essence of salvation is to is to know God to know his person to know him as the gift so we have there the gift of faith which is God himself um, let me give you another stanza of faith is the victory on every hand the foe we find drawn up in dead array let tents of ease be left behind and onward to the fray salvation's helmet on each head with truth all girt about the earth shall tremble neath our tread and echo with our shout but you hear that one state it says let us uh, have salvation's helmet on each head with truth all girt about and here's a truth for you the truth is, is that the gift that we receive in salvation is God himself that's the truth third thing I want to talk about the focus of faith look at verse uh, verses um, 7 and 8 but, but, but verse 8 specifically says this I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand I shall not be moved so David is David's saying, I'm keeping my focus on the Lord. Which means I'm keeping my focus on the real point of faith, the essence of salvation, which is God himself, the gift, which is what we need to do. How often, how often are we reminded 
I need to keep my eyes on the Lord. Keep my eyes on God. How many times have you told somebody else that, that you're trying to encourage them, or maybe they've strayed away from the Lord, and you remind them, look, you've got to keep your eyes on God. How many times of us, we've gone through struggles and difficulties, disappointments and tragedies, and we've said to ourselves, if somebody else has said to us, just keep your eyes on the Lord, right? Focus matters. Keep your eyes. Keep your eyes on the Lord. Keep your mind on the Lord. Now, when we do, that produces three things, okay? First of all, there's stability. Keeping our eyes on the Lord produces stability in the believer. Look at verse, uh, verses 7 and 8. He says, I will bless the Lord who's given me counsel. My heart also instructs me in the night seasons. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Let me ask you a question. Do you think David had things in his life that could distract him? Like what? Yeah. Running a kingdom. Like, yeah, and he got distracted all right, you know. Enemies. Saul, yeah, even before he became king, you know, Saul was after him. I mean, David's life was one. I mean, his life was filled with, with trouble, with, with persecution, opposition. You think we have things that can distract us? Get our focus off of the Lord? Do you think we have things in our life that do distract us and gets our focus off the Lord? Absolutely. But you know, you can really only, you, we really only do what our attention is focused on. You really can only do what your attention, you, you know, you may be physically present somewhere, but what your mind is really concentrating on is somewhere else. That's the focus. So there's all kinds of things that distract us. And we have our own troubles. And we have our own pains and so forth. But here's the thing. Remember Paul said, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. But you know what? You can't do that if focus is not on the Lord. So in other words, so when we stay focused the focus of faith on the Lord, on the gift, the inheritance, the true inheritance, all right, it gives us stability. Secondly, it creates, it produces also serenity in the believer. Let me ask you a question. What is serenity? How do you define serenity? Now, I know first thing all of us think about when you hear serenity is the, 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 the serenity, the prayer of serenity, you know, that the AA uses and so forth. And nothing wrong with it. You know, nothing wrong with it, all right? Actually, does a pretty good expression of what serenity is. But what is serenity? What does it mean to be serene? Peace. Peace. Calmness. Confidence. Contentment. Tranquility. Joy. The absence of anxiety, the absence of hand-wringing. It's a peaceful, tranquil state. All right, look at what he says. Look at verses 9 through 11. Therefore, my heart is glad, my glory rejoices, and my flesh will also rest in hope. For you will not leave my soul in Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. Now, here's where the psalm really takes off in the direction of being the messianic part of it, okay? Because, yes, was David experiencing a sense of serenity? Yes, he was. But what he's talking about here goes even beyond what David could experience, okay? In fact, in the book of Acts, this is one of the things that they talk about right here. So notice what, what David says. Therefore, my heart is glad, my glory rejoices, my flesh shall rest in hope. Verse 10. For you will not leave my soul in Sheol, or that is in the grave, in, in the realm of the dead, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. Well, the right in the book of Acts, they said, David to this day is still in his grave. David's body is buried. His body um, 
deteriorated and, and, and broke down in that grave. Here it says, you're not going to let that happen. Well, how could that be? He has to be talking about someone greater than him. Who's he talking about? Who's the only one that didn't get left in the grave? Jesus. And so at that point, this is where it begins to take on that messianic tone. This is something that is beyond David. It is something that is beyond anybody other than Jesus. So there you begin to see the messianic. In fact, in, in, in the book of Acts, they say he prophesied. He spoke as a prophet looking forward. David, David knew serenity, but you want to know something? Jesus knew serenity too. Uh, look at the verses that follow. Verse, uh, verse number 11. Here's what he says. You will show me the path of life, and in your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Now, we know Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane. He prayed to the point where his sweat became what? Blood. I mean, you talk about intensity. You talk about sensing the pressure. Prayed, Father, let this cup pass from me if at all possible. So did Jesus wrestle with and struggle with that? And, and here's the thing. I don't, I don't believe it was necessarily so much the physical death that Jesus was agonizing over as much as it was the spiritual dimension of what was going to happen. Because what we know is and when Jesus was hanging on the cross and when he uttered those words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That was the moment when, as Paul said in, in the book of uh, uh, 1 Corinthians, that he who knew no sin was made sin, and the wrath of God was poured out on Jesus. Notice, he didn't just bear sin. The Bible says he became sin. Think about that. I, I, that's what Jesus was wrestling over more than anything else. Now, was he looking forward to the physical pain and the agony? No. You know, the writer of Hebrews says that Jesus, that for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is now set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Um, but more than anything else, what Jesus was struggling with was that moment of when that transaction of him becoming sin and the wrath of God and the separation between him and the Father, that's what Jesus was dreading. But, but here's the thing. You say, well, we're talking about serenity. I believe that when Jesus, and by the way, John 17, which we read from a few minutes ago, which was the prayer that was prayed after they left Gethsemane, his high priestly prayer, that prayer has nothing but a tone of serenity all the way through it. Was Jesus wrestling with these things in the Garden of Gethsemane? Absolutely, intensely. But here's what I believe. I believe that when Jesus got up, when he left the Garden of Gethsemane from that point on, he was at peace, totally and completely at peace. He was serene. He was, even though he still had to go through those, that difficulty, the pain and the suffering, he was calm. Jesus never lost it through that whole process. He never got short with anybody. He never lashed out at anybody. He never whimpered and whined and complained. He never pouted. He showed no self-pity. Uh, when Jesus left the Garden of Gethsemane, it was all in God's hands and he was serene. He, 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 was, he was trusting his Father. That's, what the, that's, what, that's the victory that faith gives us if we just lean on the Father trust Him let me give you one last stanza from faith is the victory very fitting for what we were just reading right here to him that overcomes the foe what enables us to overcome the foe victory victory of faith faith to him that overcomes the foe white raiment shall be given before the angels he shall know his name confessed in heaven. Then onward from the hills of light our hearts with love aflame will vanquish all the host of night in Jesus' conquering name. Faith is the victory, O oh, glorious victory, that overcomes the world. 
And there again, listen. I said earlier, the just shall live by faith is a theme that is developed and revealed all the way through Scripture. The victory of faith is also a theme that is developed all the way through Scripture. From end to end. In fact, I've been reading through the book of Genesis, uh, uh, the book of uh, Exodus, um, and um, just finished reading through the Gospel of John and the Epistles of John. And so I started reading through the book of Exodus a couple of days ago, and so I've gotten up to the Red Sea and so forth. And, um, you know, it's interesting. You know, when God finally said to Moses, he said, you know, why do you cry unto me, you know, Hold out your staff across the water and, and I'll delay. And then he says this, and stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. You just trust me and you just stand still. What's your job? Trust me. Trust me. And then you'll see the salvation of the Lord. Egyptians are coming down on them. What does God do? He takes that cloud and he moves it behind their ranks of the Israelites and between them and the Egyptians. And there's not a thing in the world the Egyptians can do about it. And it gives the Israelites time to pass across on the Red Sea on dry ground. And I believe it was desert dry. What a thing in the world. And did, did, the, did the Israelites have anything to do with it? Absolutely not. What is, you stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. I'm telling you, it's an amazing thing what God does when we will just be resolute to trust him. Are there things that sometimes we have to do? Uh, yes. But oftentimes, we think we need to do something to help God, which, by the way, got Abraham and Sarah in trouble, and the world's been paying the price ever since. So often we think there's something we need to do to help God. Do what only he can do. And when the reality is, there's not a thing in the world we can do but trust and obey and wait on him and let him do what only he can do. Now, don't misunderstand me. That doesn't mean we're supposed to sit back on our laurels and we just give it up. But we do have to understand that there are some times and some moments that it's completely out of our hands. It's in his hand. What are we supposed to do? Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. And when we do, we know the victory of faith. Think about Joshua, Jericho. Walk around the city. One time each night for seven nights, then seven nights. Then at the end, shout hallelujah, and the walls come down. It's the victory of faith. The same victory of faith the same way Jesus won victory by trusting his father all right Eric any questions thoughts comments all right thank you so much for being with us thanks to those online for joining us and uh, remember 21st we'll be back live on Facebook all right we'll close out thanks have a good evening <laughs>